you are watching and listening to and I hope enjoying a moose bouche bite-sized portions of poetry brought to you by uh, like a super group of poetry uh, myself, Elaine Cusa, Andrew Slater and Johnny Depp, I mean Ron McCain um, anyway I'm going to share with you four of my poems now and in the first section I talked about my nan and after she died my mum and dad insisted that I went on holiday with them to Tenerife. Um, I didn't want to go there, I wanted to stay in my bedroom and listen to the Smiths with my curtains closed. That's something I still like to do nowadays, but um, anyway, I was dragged to Tenerife and I wrote this poem and um, each verse is like a little, little postcard from that holiday island and it's called Tourism is the Major Industry in Tenerife. On this island, where the grass is as brittle as burnt wicks, and cats' lives are as easily snapped by vehicle wheels. I plan to spend a fortnight. On the balcony, I offer myself up to the sun, and like all meat, I'm burnt. I sacrifice my wage to be sacrificed. This strange fruit is wondrous, and its name, unpronounceable. It's the sort I've only stared at in Marks and Spencer food halls. The small shrines at the roadside worry me. My driver hates his seatbelt, and I've known people who've been killed abroad. The northern village contrasts with luxury holiday homes built by, amongst others, northern villagers. Building contractors, annual turnovers, treble. At the harbour, the meal reminds me of another we shared. Swigging wine, lukewarm with heat, looks so bohemian with bread and cheese. The sea, of course, never changes, but it's warmer than Tynemouth. <clears throat> and sea salt, I think, tastes better than morning tea that blots out the night before. Thank you. Come in, do help yourself to a drink. You're a happy to. Alright, she's got my feet, that's great. Um, <laughs> that last poem mentioned Tynemouth, and uh, it's quite interesting that sort of 20 years after writing the poem, I now live in Whitney Bay, which is about two miles away from Tynemouth. And I love living by the sea. I don't know if you enjoy living where you live, but I, I love living by the sea, and um, it gives me time and space to think about life, the universe, and everything. And this is what this next poem's about. It's inspired by Buddhism. Um, I think Buddhists have got the right idea, you know, they, they think that death is certain, but the time of death is uncertain. So this little poem is called Buddhist Blueprint. Watch us move through life gracefully, harmlessly, with death as our anchor. History. Um, 150 years ago, in January 1862, the first major mining disaster of the Victorian era took place in Northumberland. Um, the New Hartley Colliery disaster claimed the lives of over 200 men and boys. It decimated a community. It tugged at the heartstrings of the recently widowed Queen Victoria and forced an act of Parliament that uh, actually improved mining safety. So a lot of things happened as a result of the disaster, but it, it, it was terrible. It, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't have happened. Um, and so this poem is written in tribute to the people who lost their lives. And it's called History Lesson. Yalrit Mara, where are we going to meet then? The young man sitting opposite me on the metro into town from the coast is finalizing tonight's plan of action. I try guessing his age early 20s, and smile at the memory of Friday nights out and about in Newcastle with maids. Mind, we never had mobile phones back then, and I never used the word Mara, but it was part of my childhood, along with bait, midden, and gallows in the field. Coal mining had its own language, which I taught myself as the mines closed down round here. I saw secret kingdoms in my nan's fire and kept imaginary gallows in the coal shed at the side of her house. 
It's hard not to be sentimental when you're a sapling on the northern coal field. I bite my lip when I hear Gresford and see archive footage of striking miners. I want to be reminded of the facts. That's why I visit Beamish and Woodhorn. But there's another place I drive to when I need to connect with local history. It always rains when I visit Erston, a pretty village two miles from my home. So I dress for the weather, take a notebook and pen, and force myself to breathe deeply as I head into St Albans churchyard. I walk round the church, and soon I'm beside that horrible, beautiful obelisk, the Hartley Disaster Memorial. I circle it slowly, reading each name and age from 10 to 71, and my eyes swim with identical surnames of dead brothers, uncles, fathers, and sons. There were heroes above and below ground in January 1862, Miners, widows, vicars, coffin makers, plus men like Watson, Colson, and Weems Reed. There were villains too who came to gawp at swollen stiff corpses, but most wanted to support a community let down by willful ignorance of recent events. In this age of advanced capitalism, there's still so much we can learn from our past. Let Hartley remind you to cherish your family, your community, and your marrows. Thank you. I've always believed that poets should tell the truth. I think we do most of the time, but I have to admit that this last poem in this section contains a dirty great lie. Um, I talk about the year 1986, but I know for a fact that the events took place in 1985, and I know that because it was the very day that Live Aid took place. Um, on that day when millions of people were enjoying Freddie Mercury and status quo on their tellies, I was acting very suspiciously down a side alley in Newcastle. Um, anyway, that's, that's the story behind the poem. It's also a tribute to Newcastle's answer to Stockton Arc, and that is the Tyneside Cinema. It's called Excavating Elaine. It was saved from a skip in 1986. I set it free when no one was looking down a certain alley in Newcastle city centre. It stood out for me from the heavy boot ledgers, office equipment and Bakelite telephones that filled the skip. I took my treasure under my arm and made my way to Monument Metro. It held pride of place in my teenage back bedroom where, time and time again, I'd ex examine every centimetre of my new favourite possession, a wooden sign, hand-painted in yellow, green, gold, black and red for Tyneside Cinema customers. It stood on my late nan's radiogram and leant against a wall covered in posters and pictures of pop stars and literary influences with lines from my poems graffitied in between. It was packed away and moved three years later when my parents bought their retirement home in Bladen and I went to university, then London. The sign spent 15 years in mum and dad's garage directing goals to the cinema's coffee rooms and bookshop. It lives with me now in my house by the sea. We had a joyful reunion last summer when I rediscovered books and boxes of letters in that garage. So quiet now that Dad has gone. Thank you.